Good afternoon, everybody. As my friend Marks just said, my name is Matt Larson with Digico in the US. We have Dan Page, who is the brand ambassador for Digico. Andrew Bruce from Autograph came in from London. Thank you for joining us. As well as Zach Duax from Autograph A to D in the US. Most of you of New York of Broadway markets, you would know who Zach is. And then we also have Lou Mead, who's our emotional support doc director. <laughs> I got a question before we start. Who's currently working in a small theater? Okay, who's working in a large theater? Who's only been in a movie theater? <laughs> okay, we just kind of want to get an idea of who's, who's here. So what we want to do is just kind of take a brief look of the history of theater, not just Digico side of it, but where the market has been historically, but also where we're going, get some input from some pretty heavy influencers here in the, uh, on the panel. Um, we want to look at the, uh, take a brief look of what led to the development of theater specific council software and what those features are, okay? We also want to talk about where that role was with Digico and, and the starting point for Digico actually getting in the theater market. So the first thing we want to look back, look at is what held us back or actually drove the move over digi to digital councils and why did it take us so long after Yamaha had led the way offering a large format uh, live uh, council? Yamaha had the PM1D back in 2001, which kind of became a, a pretty popular digital desk in the live market. Um, yet the theater didn't embrace the digital technology as quickly as the live industry did. Why do you think that is, Andrew? Uh, I think the answer is very simple, and that is that live sound and theatre sound are absolutely definitely not the same thing. Um, theatre sound is, uh, has very recognisable criteria. Uh, the, way we, the way we work in the theatre is cue-based. Uh, we end up with up to 100, 200, 150, 200 cues in a, a big musical. So. Just, uh, thank you, um, just, just uh, relying on the normal scope and libraries uh, that, were, that were part of the Yamaha system at the time was very, very, made it very difficult in a 200 Q uh, show, Q list, to actually uh, make, it, make it work. Um, so. We realized quite early on that theatre couldn't use that system of libraries and scope because we were driven by the pace of the script, uh, the, the size of the script. Uh, we were duty bound to put in cues to bring the right people to the center section of the console where the mixing was taking place. So. Uh, we, we ended up inevitably with very large numbers of cues and we knew at the same time that whilst you were making adjustments on the fly um, you weren't you were driven by the pace of the script so as people were as the script progressed you were forced to take your next cue take the next cue take the next cue and you didn't have time in technicals therefore to end up uh, to endlessly um, save a bit uh, or stop the proceedings and and say I've I've got to do some cue list management now before you can move on. It was being driven by the by the pace of rehearsals. So it was quite obvious that the way that um, Yamaha had adopted at the time uh, was not going to be suitable for us and it was a it was a big question mark why why on earth did we throw the baby out with the bathwater um, when we went to digital control uh, and cue lists because the analog system suited us really well you knew very well that when you made an adjustment on the console or you made us you pressed a switch or turned a knob and then had to go to the next queue, but that wouldn't flip back to where it was. It, you knew it would stay. 
And so the big question was, why isn't any digital manufacturer or writer of software emulating the analog system? Why do we have to go to libraries? Why do we have to manage it all with scope? And nobody could tell me the answer to that one. Um, and it was only when we discovered Digico that well, anybody was prepared to listen. Um, so I, I guess that's I guess that's the answer. Okay. The, uh, so with with those problems, what do you think? What was what actually got the change to happen in history? You know, tell us a little bit about what was that progression coming from an analog for your path what was the first thing where you said okay let's take a little bit deeper look at this well we had been under pressure from producers for years and years and years to go digital um, and we were always reluctant to commit to digital uh, consoles because we felt that many of the criteria that we felt were absolutely um, paramount were not necessarily in place with the early digital consoles and um, until such time as we had got at least some of our requirements into, into the software and the hardware had been properly tested and run uh, you know, over long periods of time, uh, we, we felt it wasn't right to jump in. And one of the things that really governed it for us was that we had spent years and years and years at the back of auditoria observing technical rehearsals progressing very slowly and watching lighting and automation in the early years programming early digital consoles lighting consoles automation consoles and having to program it program this thing these things in very very slow uh, ways uh, where every every parameter had to be laboriously entered uh, everything had to be given a figure a, a value uh, had to be entered moves uh, automation moves took uh, seemed to take ages to program and even slight changes took even long you know as long again to program and we vowed that until somebody came up with some software that was quick and easy to program and contained shortcuts, masses of shortcuts, so that we didn't have to uh, we didn't have to translate everything into values um, and do lots of stuff on screen until such time as that emerged we weren't prepared to jump in um, and so you know we, we, we started to compile a list of really really important things that needed to be in this software uh, the fact that it should emulate an analog console if, if all these cues flashing by you wanted to be able to make adjustments on the fly skip on to the next queue without having to save, skip on to the next queue without having to save, continue, continually adjust, make adjustments, because as we know, it, when we're working in theatre, uh, you only have a very small window of opportunity to get things to sound right before they've moved on, and you probably, probably won't see that scene or that person again for a day or two in the technical period. Um, so we needed to know that any, any work that we did that we were going to do was never going to be risk, risk being lost because we had to step on to the next queue. So the most important thing was going to be that the console kept up with us, not that we had to manage the console in any way. So that's what I mean by making it an analog emula uh, emulation of an analog console. It needed to work like an analog console because we were driving it with the speed of the queue list. Um, uh, and we didn't have time for programming, uh, saving things into libraries, and then altering scope in order to make sure that things 
reoccurred in, forth, in, in subsequent queues. Um, so shortcuts and what we called auto-update were the two really important things that we needed to get through into, into the software. But it, it, it wasn't in fact Digico that started that digital console development, it was Soundcraft uh, through uh, their, their aptly named Broad, Broadway Broad, console, was Broadway that Broadway console, yes. I, um, in uh, about 1993, I was invited by Soundcraft um, to come and talk to them about their first possibility of getting into the digital console world for a theatre console, um, which they wanted to call the Broadway. Should have been the West End, but you know, there you go. <laughs> um, and they wanted to talk to somebody, and these, this was the first company who ever actually decided that they wanted to talk to somebody in the industry about it. Uh, they wanted to talk to somebody uh, to see what it was we wanted and how we wanted it to work. Um, so I was invited clandestinely because we were a Kadak user, a big Kadak user at the time. Uh, we were invited to go and talk to them and uh, they said we, want, we really want to work with you and we really want to get um, a, a theatre console out there. Um, so what do you need it to do? So we started compiling uh, a list of these very important things that we felt had to be uh, included and uh, we worked for them with them for about two years uh, on this console which gradually took shape and uh, the hardware took shape and the software took shape but it, w it needed a platform to to launch it and I was uh, at the time working on several of Cameron McIntosh's shows and we needed a new show to put this on and see if it worked because Cameron had been one of the main people who'd been trying to ask me to reduce the uh, footprint of the consoles that we were taking up at the back of the auditorium so he wanted the seats back so he was push he was uh, pushing 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 to uh, for us to go digital and I was saying absolutely not we haven't got anything nothing that I regard uh, good enough as being good enough to uh, actually put on one of these shows because the programming is too basic and doesn't suit us. And when Soundcraft came along and they said that they thought they would be ready to launch this, we luckily had a show of Cameron's that we could put it on and uh, called Martin Guerre, it was in London. And we decided that we would put on not only a Soundcraft, but we might just put a Kadak on the other side of the aisle just in case it didn't work. Um, which was a, quite a good move because actually it didn't work. It, we were much too soon. The uh, digital control of analog uh, worked fine, but the speed of processing was nowhere near fast enough, so it would crash endlessly. Uh, we didn't give it an opportunity to crash live because we, uh, we were using the Kadak at the time, but every time I walked past the Soundcraft, it just showed error on the screen. And they manfully sort of uh, braved, bravely toiled on until they decided that actually uh, they were going to just take it away and work on it elsewhere. Um, but we did end up with a wealth of information and uh, thinking and thought processes and essays that we'd written and designs that we had come up with for screens and surfaces and banks and ways of manipulating the data uh, and inputting the data that we thought was going to be the way forward. Sadly, it didn't work. Um, and we had to swallow our pride, continue with Kadak. And it wasn't until three or four years later, in 2003, two, that we <laughs> uh, have a prompter over there, uh, 2002, that we um, met up with um, Digico at an exhibition in London. And the weird thing was that the console that they were showing us, that they were showing, looked almost exactly like, it didn't look like the Broadway, but it had all the same principles visible on the surface straight away 
and I thought I almost thought that they had taken people from the uh, Soundcraft development team and uh, and hijacked them over to Digico, but it was it was quite obviously the right platform that uh, uh, was there in front of us, and I went to them there and then at the exhibition and asked uh, James Gordon, who was demonstrating at the time, who's sitting over there on the left, if he would be interested in working with us on a theatre version of the software, which was, it was called D5, would, would, uh, would they be interested in developing something maybe called D5T? And James, to his credit, immediately jumped at it and said yes. I said, we have a lot of information for which I didn't sign any non-disclosure agreements. I wasn't asked to sign an agreement with Soundcraft. It was sort of just, it was just there. And I said, I'd be happy to make this available to Digico uh, and work with them on it. And to their credit, they immediately put us in touch with the software writers who came to London, down to London and came to watch existing shows in action and I have to say they were um, their jaws were on the floor they went white when they realized how fast it all happens in the theater how you know how we deal with theater uh, with musicals particularly um, how many cues and how the cues fly by um, so I'm rambling on it. Well, that, that was perfect because what you're basically saying is failure can be good. You can learn. Failure can be good. As Absolutely. you're pushing technology. Absolutely. Working with various manufacturers, you're trying to get better tools for, for your trade. Yes. So what was it like then? Did you then go back and refine your list after your, the failures just to see what would be the most important features that we would have to have and then make some compromises there? Yes, so it, there, was a, there was a very clear list of, of features that were must-haves that, that had to be included in, in the, uh, the, the, the software, the first of which we've talk, I've talked about, which we called, we christened. Uh, auto update, which was the ability to make changes on the fly uh, and never ever have to save anything before you moved on. Because as we know, the queue list drives the speed, you know, the, the show drives the speed of the queue list and you couldn't, in technicals, keep stopping and asking them to, um, to allow you to save and do queue list management, you just had to keep going. So that was the most important and it was we christened it auto update and it manifests itself in the way that you can basically just make changes on the fly continuously any variable controller or switch can be pressed turned you can pre keep pressing next go backwards and forwards through the queue list as you do during a technical rehearsal um, and never press save never do any management at all exactly as you would do with an analog console so that was the first that was the first and most important thing that you had to get through um, one of the things that that uh, became obvious to the uh, software writers when they came to London is that they didn't realize that we follow every line every single line has to be a fader move um, which is what drives the the fact that um, you know we have 200 cues because you know you've only got 12 or 16 control groups or whatever and so you've got to keep moving on in order to bring the right people the right channels to the center section of the, the in front of the operator um, so uh, let's see I've got a note here that says dedicated sound checks rarely take place early enough in the production process yes so um, staging, lighting, scenery almost always seem to take priority and the orchestra is of, often not present in the room when we're doing technical rehearsals. We're, de we're dealing with a, a piano and a lot of radio mics and uh, maybe, if we're lucky, hats and costumes, but because of the expense, we won't necessarily have the or orchestra until much later in the process. So we are, um, we are working only with half, half of the system. Thing vocal system uh, and a piano um, so we don't get sound checks as such so every little 
bit of information that we can get into the console in terms of EQ dynamic adjustments and routing things. We have to we have to pick it up at any time and stick it in the Q list and um, harvest it as we go through. Um, we won't we won't get an orchestra until much later in the process. Um, so this sort of process of continuous refinement um, is really important. We we mustn't ever lose any of the data, any of the adjustments that we make. And we certainly can't lose it because we've forgotten to save before we press next. So that's really, really, really important. Uh, yeah, is that? Yeah, I mean, I've got down a note here. Theatre of Sound is a work in pro progress. It's an endless work in progress that doesn't stop until long after op opening night, because you're still making adjustments for understudies and alternates and all these, all these people. Sounds great. So what you're really saying is that. It's kind of like in a studio, how a studio can do so many different sessions in a given week. You're kind of working on little elements of the show, and you might have to jump back and forth because something's not ready, and the digital platform really helped refine that. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It's just endless acquisition of data that you're feeding into the session. Uh, and uh, you, you, you take it where you can, and you get, it in, you get your EQ and dynamics and routing and all that stuff in where you can. Uh, and, it, you know... It, Sound, it sounds a, a little bit as though we're, you know, there's a there's a traditional thing in theatre sound is that nobody waits for theatre sound. They wait for lighting and automation and props and wigs and shoes. Uh, but when theatre when the sound people say, "Could we just stop?" There's a huge groan goes up from stage management, and they go, "Oh, we're waiting for sound." Um, so you know, we we are. We've always been aware that uh, we're kind of at the back of the bus, you know, when it comes to that. And uh, in a way, we've we've let that happen, and uh, we shouldn't have done. We should we should have stood up for ourselves much earlier on. And it's getting it's getting better. And I mean, we do get we get do get time um, given to us now for things, but uh, never quite enough, you know. Yeah. So we we ended up in a situation really. There were. As you know, we've got on the screen two two principles of our system that we were looking to develop, which is you know it had to be this fast, efficient workflow uh, queueless management system that 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 didn't require this library management and all, and all that sort of stuff because there really was not time for it at all. Um, you know, of course, the digital systems added lots of other benefits over you know the Cadax and the the other the yeah. other systems that that were in place at the time. But um, the primary thing that the digital thing had to do was emulate the functionality from a Qless point of view that we had with with Cadax and other analog analog systems in place. Yeah. Um, in fact, Zach, you've been involved in uh, taking out some analog stuff recently with a look to put yeah. in some Digico in. Uh, so we're down. Um, I was down at Wicked where they're pulling off their Cadax that they've still been touring with, and they're putting in an SD7 Quantum T, um, and. One of the first steps was taking all of their programming through the CADAC and, and how they were mixing it. And uh, then translating and putting all that data into the SD7. Um, and not only that, just the acquisition of that data, ordering it, and then using the same workflow that they're already used to using with the, uh, an analog desk became quite quick for them because literally they're mimicking the same movements as if they're mixing their show while inputting that data into the SD7. Yeah. Yeah. But um, the, the, the SAM software actually had quite an influence in... Absolutely. Uh, it, the SAM software, which is what the CADAC uses to control its VCA assignment, is kind of the, the basis, or a model, or one of the other contributions that here Andrew has yeah, added well, to our world, yes. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're, we started with uh, the very, very, very basic CADAC software back in uh, 1984, uh, which had no screen, and it was uh, there was it was just a way of recording control groups, control group assignments, uh, and it had to be programmed using a, 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 a Tandy computer and a boffin <laughs> who sat under the desk for hours uh, programming it. And it couldn't be changed, you know. Once it had been programmed, uh, that that uh, turned into a, a different 
beast when we brought chess to Broadway back in 88 with a slightly more updated version of it uh, which did at least have a screen and a keyboard uh, but it wasn't very it wasn't very good um, Clive Green then came up with a different uh, version of it called CGC which the older people here may remember uh, that wasn't good either we started writing our own version of that software called G-Type which controlled um, CADAX all the way through to J-Type CADAX uh, and it was only when Clive Green stopped sharing the code for the later J-Type CADAX with us that we then uh, migrate, tried to migrate to Soundcraft. Uh, that happened to coincide that Soundcraft came and asked me at the time when Clive Green uh, stopped sharing his code so that really prompted us to go and look look uh, look at Soundcraft or work with Soundcraft. When that didn't work we came back to Kadak with the tail between our, egg, our legs uh, and helped them de develop SAM software which then um, was the last one that we had before before we jumped ship into Digica. Yeah. Okay. Can you briefly describe the uh, operation of auto update and other features that you've got with the queue list of scoping and that type of stuff? Well, it's like, um, I, don't, I don't use scope at all. No. I, I turn everything, I put everything in scope from day one and it never goes out of scope. It's actually one of the, one of the benefits of the, the theater software is that scope management isn't a thing at all. Everything is left switched on to update and recall all the time and the auto update system takes complete control over how those changes are propagated through the queue list. So, you know, you can be in, in, a, in, a, in a queue near the top of the show and make an adjustment. And as you fire the queues and step through the show, those changes are automatically written and propagated down the show. And that, that happens, you know, partly because the scopes aren't part of the equation. They are left so everything is recalled and updated. Of indeed, course, indeed um, if you're using theatre software, you shouldn't. You really shouldn't, for your own sanity, start using a hybrid of uh, theatre software in auto update mode and then trying to use scope as well because uh, you will get yourself in terrible knots and anyway uh, you can do all uh, you can do 99.99 percent of everything you need to do uh, using the theater software without ever having to go to the scope page absolutely I mean if I if I flip over to the software um, and we have a quick uh, a quick look in our theater options we have this, uh, this scope, which you can see across the screen, and this auto-update exclusion. The principle being that most elements of the console automatically propagate and update to all the other queues based on this selection. Now, there are, of course, elements within a channel which it would make no sense to update to all the queues. You know, muting a, muting a channel in, you know, queue 10, if that automatically applied the mute across all the other queues, that would, that would be ridiculous. But it may be that you want individual queues to accept those those changes so the auto update system has this rule where you can auto update to either one queue or you can auto update to all the queues and that's where this this selection here comes in quite common also for the delay element to be to be part of that scope so we're making delay changes to single queues rather than all the queues for you know artistic reasons yeah uh, so, so that you can literally track people around the stage if they're they stay still for long enough you could you can actually uh, enter a delay into their channel which will make it work better um, and uh, you wouldn't want that those delays to propagate through throughout the entire queue list because you may want to put another queue as they move and another queue as they move and change that delay time um, of course you know if we're making changes that are applied to the entire queue list there are times when you would want those changes to be written just to a single queue for artistic reasons. You know, uh, someone you know has a, a, a direction from the director where they have to stand maybe against a piece of scenery which blocks the microphone and you need to change an EQ value. And again, we have a system by which with, with a single button pressing on the console, we can make an adjustment to an EQ value or to, to any controller value and it automatically inverts the rule so that that change is written to a single queue as opposed to all the queues and again this is trying to you know stop people having to manage libraries press update press save manage all of those things manually because as you know as Andrew's you know said that there really isn't time for that within the running of 
uh, running of tech rehearsals where you know we have to follow you know, what is going on stage. We don't drive the show in that respect. We we just deal with whatever is and, thrown at us. And and I think most importantly of all, you've got a you've got a job to do. You're trying to make things sound better, and it's hard enough as it is without having to take time out to do queue list management and library management and all of that sort of thing. So, you know, keeping things flowing and moving in the simplest possible way with the largest number of shortcuts is really important. Um, do we want to go so, on to... Yeah, should we go on to uh, some other features of yeah. Uh, yeah. the yeah. aliases and players? Yeah. yeah, I mean, quite obviously, merely making a digital console emulate an analog console um, and stop it from, uh, or at least allow you to re retain things uh, isn't very interesting unless you can also make use of the things that digital uh, programming can do for you and the most important we thought at the time, the top of the list that we had identified when we were talking with Soundcraft was the ability to handle hats and co other costume changes because in the analog world having the time to make a physical adjustment to a set of marks on the console um, was uh, okay for maybe one or, one or two characters when they put a hat on but beyond that uh, it was impossible to achieve so quite obviously a digital console could help with that. So. Uh, we christened it, we christened the routine aliases, it sort of seemed to reflect the job that it was going to do, which was when somebody put on a hat, it's like an alias, um, and it was creating, it was about creating a place to put a subset of settings for that character and give it a name, and once you'd given it a name, you would then be able to uh, put that set of settings into any queue you wanted and you could continue as we know with auto update to refine that because you may only get a few seconds to make the adjustments required when that person's got their hat on and singing or speaking before they take it off again so as long as you've got an alias in place on the console for when that person puts the hat on you can start work on it and when he takes his hat off and you go to the next queue, you know that anything you've done during that period of time will be retained and you don't have to stop and say, I've got to save or say, I can't move on until I've saved. It will automatically be saved so that when you move out of that queue and he's taken his hat off and you go, go to the next queue, you go back to the settings automatically. And you also know that when you come to use that set of settings, later on in the show, when he puts his hat on again, that any work that you've already done in the uh, preceding cues will come back and it will be there for you and you can continue on the work of refining the EQ until you get it right. Um, nothing should ever be wasted. So, so basically what you're saying is if he's wearing the hat in one scene and you adjust the EQ, that same EQ happens every time he's wearing the hat all the way through the entire yes, it's up to you. performance. It's up to you to identify from in rehearsals when he's going to put the hat on and you will, you will have to make a cue that brings that hat alias onto the console for that, for that cue when he puts the hat on. Uh, it may run for a run of cues but, uh, and you'll be lucky that you get you know, several cues in order to make adjustments to that character's uh, EQ. Uh, but when you step out of it and he takes his hat off and you step out of it and he, uh, you go back to his normal alias, his standard alias without any, anything, uh, you're back to whatever work you've done on that. Uh, and if you then have to put the hat alias into a later queue, it will come back with the benefit of everything you've done so far. And the reason it's done is because it's not, we're not storing, da sorry, uh, Digico are not storing data for every queue. They're just storing it in one place and it's a series of pointers. Uh, so the, the hat alias EQ is just a set of data stored in one place in the, in the software, uh, in the queue list, uh, sorry, session, uh, and it's referenced. So you're just 
changing that set of data in the reference point. And you so, could use that for a musician who plays a different style guitars or different yeah. presets? You, you absolutely can, you know. Um, he, uh, he, he, you can use it for uh, alternate um, in different instruments. Um, Exactly. So it's it's not just if, if you uh, just if you see on the screen, I've opened up the the software panel for it in the channel aliases, um, and you can see here the Frodo channel has four aliases, all of which can contain these different variations of the character, the different settings, um, which you can you know recall into any of the cues at any time. Uh, we can control the interaction between the aliases. So actually, for a lot of the parts of the channel, it may be that you know orc sends and group routings and you know, a lot of those type of things are going to be shared and the same no matter what costume or outfit or accessory the, the, the character has. But there are some differences, you know, maybe EQ values and, you know, dynamics or, you know, whatever you decide needs to be different because they've got a hat on. So for each of these aliases, we can control the interaction between them and, and how changes you make affect other aliases' uses of the, of the channel. So it's a very powerful system to it gives you total control and... Um, it really just seems like we're stumbling over the same kind of rules, but there is just a handful of rules where what is checked will be inherited and then propagated through our uh, queue list. Um, and then what is X'd out are things that will you want to be unique to that alias. Um, and just with uh, very simple rules, we can handle very complex problems of uh, quick set, uh, set changes or even um, not just uh, by applying it to say musicians or to playback devices um, where you need to lump a one state that is frequently revisited uh, versus a second state which is also frequently revisited re uh, and you want to have the reliability of both states of an analog desk and have that behavior but then also take advantage of the digital frame and be able to switch easily back and forth there, there are there are two uh, there are two stages to this I mean we always uh, referred to it originally as what do, as inheritance so when you are when you are creating an alias you want to firstly decide what does the new alias inherit from its parent we refer to them as parent and children so the parent is the original raw alias of the channel. Uh, its first child would be Frodo Hat 1. What does, what does Frodo Hat 1 inherit from its parent Frodo? Uh, and that's the pattern of um, ticks. All ticks in the, sorry, checks in, in, this, um, uh, in this one here. And then checks and crosses are those which it shares or, or doesn't share with its parent. Uh, one of the things that uh, I often sort of say is that, you know, you can, on a smaller console where you're limited with the number of channels, you can sometimes be in a situation where you have to reuse channels uh, to do completely different jobs. So after a character has been killed off or left the stage or uh, is no longer needed, you can maybe use that for, for, some, for a, diff a totally different use. Uh, and in uh, not in this queue list, I, I but in what, another demonstration queue list that I had, I had Alice being replaced by the Cheshire Cat, um, and quite obviously the Cheshire Cat doesn't want to inherit anything of Alice's original characteristics. So at the point where you make an alias for the Cheshire Cat, everything on the left-hand column, everything on the left-hand column will be crossed. So no, nothing will be inherited. So there will be nothing to share at that point. At that point, if the Cheshire Cat puts on a hat, um, then there will be things shared and things, other things not shared. But you can use it in, you can use it for that, um, that particular. So Zach brought up a good thing also, talking about the aliases. When you go onto a smaller desk, like Andrew brought up, you might be tight for channels. So like your QLab, and a lot of times we'll take QLab and we'll put it in multiple stereo channels. Here you could actually reduce it to maybe one or two stereo channels using your alias. So I have a question on the, um, the flow of rehearsals. When you have your principal actors, at what point are you typically getting into the understudies and then how do you manage 
the understudies and various players, if you I'm will. I'm glad you asked that. Huh? <laughs> I'm here for you, man. <laughs> one, one thing that we said uh, very early on to Digico when we were working with them on the D5T was that um, in the theater, it's a fact of life that um, you'll have alternate players, alternates, understudies, two or three understudies sometimes. So you may have just finally refined the EQ on your principal and uh, immediately you find yourself in, uh, uh, in understudy land because, uh, because you do. Uh, and the problem is th that um, you know, you'll be set with a whole new set of problems that you want to once, once again retain. You don't want to lose any opportunity to harvest the, uh, you know, the, the, the time and get, get EQ for a different person uh, into the session. Uh, and we would, be very, would have been very, very pleased if the D5T had been able to offer that, that opportunity uh, to keep track of multiple players for any particular role. And we said to them that if you manage to get, squeeze that into the software, you will find that the entire theatre community on both sides of the Atlantic will love you forever because they'll realise that you understand exactly the problems that they have to deal with. Look at James smiling over there. <laughs> well, sadly, they couldn't do it <laughs> <laughs> on the D5T, uh, which is why uh, when SD7 came along and all the, all the uh, related ones, we breathed a huge sigh of relief because they said, now, now the session structure is such that we will be, be able to offer you this feature, which we called players, uh, to be able to define any number, actually there probably is a maximum number of people to play any particular role. You set them up in advance and um, you can hot ch change from one uh, player to another mid-show without doing anything apart from going to the pa that panel on screen and selecting another player to, who's playing the role. Um, and as long as you either step to the next queue or refire the same queue, all the parameters that are associated with the new player will be on the, on the console for you. You can then continue to refine the EQ and dynamics and everything that are associated with this new player. And you know that you've, you've got that in the session so that three weeks from now or three months from now, when that understudy comes back into the frame or is thrown on in the middle of a show because the principal has broken their leg, that you've got something already going for you and you can continue to add to it. Obviously, any aliases, <coughs> excuse me, any aliases that have been created for the principal player are already there for the understudy, the alternate, the second understudy. There's just it's just a set of buckets that get filled, so you don't have to start creating aliases for the second player, uh, the understudies. I think they're already there for you. Absolutely. Um, in a similar way, when we're creating, uh, you know, defining the auto update rules and looking at you know which elements of the console get updated, and when we looked at aliases, what the interaction between the aliases are, uh, we have a, a, a similar thing for the players so again we can control which elements of players are going to be different or unique depending on you know characteristics of their voice and their gain you know how loud they sing so gain adjustments might be different um, but again you know in terms of raw programming group selection and which orc sends and those sort of things are going to be common across all players so this this second uh, scope which you see on screen called the single player update allows us again to control the interaction between the, the players that we have. So, you know, when we when we took the knowledge we had from D5T terms and you know set about putting the theatre software onto the SD7, we had you know the element of of prior knowledge and you know the, the things that Andrew and you know other sound designers had asked us to do, which allowed us to you know to invent these these new features and implement these functions, which ultimately are going to make your lives easier, programming and running shows. Yeah. And of course, once again, a player doesn't have to be a person, it can be an instrument. Um, so when you, ha when you have uh, depths in the pit uh, who play completely differently, you can just select a different player. You can also select, in the case of a, uh, a drummer, 
a whole set of microphones to change from one player to the other at, in one go, um, which is quite useful. Beautiful. Let's talk about some other features that the, the theater software has. Can you talk about control groups? Some people would call those VCAs. Digital calls them control groups and how you manage those? Yeah. Assigning characters, instruments, groups of characters to the control groups should not be long-winded. It's a very easy thing to do if you've got the right tool, if you've got a spreadsheet type display, you should be able to drop in, pop in characters, character names, alias names, groups of characters, instruments, into an array, a matrix uh, that shows you, that is on screen, that, that's showing you your control groups and the cues. Cues down the left hand side, control groups across the top. It allows a mixer, an A1, to decide what they want, who they want in whichever control group, and see the progress of the, throughout the progress of the show, where they are, where they come to, how they ripple forward. Um, to manipulate the the uh, the, the people, uh, the, the assignments add people to other people. You know, um, create create uh, scratch sets of people, or use predetermined sets of people. In a rehearsal room, you'll be often gathering information about. Uh, altos, tenors, sopranos, basses, boys, girls, um, peasants, soldiers, um, sharks, jets, you know, <laughs> things like that, and gathering them into predefined sets of people, which with, a, with this control group cues feature allows you to literally assign a, a group of people, 20 people, one click, rippled down five cues in one clip, which would take you half an hour to program if you were doing it one by one. So I, I can actually give you a quick demonstration here. We've got uh, our control group cues panel up. Um, cues down the left-hand side, as Andrew says, and cues across the top. And I can come into any of these cells and using this assign panel at the bottom, I can pick individual people to go into individual control group assignments. And that's not rippling, it's just a single easy thing. It can be done offline, by you know, uh, a sound designer or associate sound designer during the running of tech rehearsals. They don't have to be in the same queue. It's a, it's a really quick, easy, powerful way of doing it. Uh, but actually, um, the ripple function um, allows us to ripple the change down the show, which means as you fire subsequent queues, those assignments stick. Um, and it's a really quick way of doing it. So if I come into here, um, and make some assignments, you'll see that the assignment I make, and I'm going to pick one of the sets, it will ripple down the show and it will stop when it sees a programming uh, entry that already exists. So it won't overwrite entries that exist, but it will allow you to fill those gaps with, uh, with assignments, either from individual, uh, individual channels or sets that are predefined groups of channels. Uh, down the bottom here, you can see in the red, we have the alias selection, so as well as assigning control groups or channels into uh, into our VCA points, our control groups, we can also choose which version of the character, which alias comes to, the, can come to the, the control group at the same time. So this one panel actually of all of the shortcut programming tools that make programming sort of theatre shows quick and easy, this is I would say probably the, the biggest, most important part of, of planning because ultimately when you're running a show what happens in those 12 faders in front of you determine you know the the the, the sonic sort of performance of the show would you say yeah yeah and you don't you don't want to be having to fiddle around with the the surface to do this you just want to do it in a spreadsheet form you want to you've got the cues in front of you you know when the person puts the hat on when he takes it off you just want to be able to literally pick that alias put it put it in the cell let it ripple forward until such time as he takes the hat off and then you clear it from the cell and it's all done and you've you've done two things at the same time you've assigned that alias you've you've assigned that person on the console to VCA and you've also sorry control group and you've also changed the alias at the same time 
So you don't have to do it separately. It's doing the two things simultaneously. Fantastic. Zach, I have a question for you and Andrew. What is the biggest show of inputs in snapshots that you've seen? Cues. How many? Cues. Oh, cues? Yeah. How many inputs does it have and how many cues are we talking about? What's our biggest? Yeah, I'm biggest just inputs. wondering, like, the, how many inputs in, you know, how big is the biggest show that you guys have worked on or the, seen? The, big, the biggest show in terms of cues I've ever seen was 212 um, for Lord of the Rings. Okay. Yeah. And actually, you know, when you, when you come to managing that data, programming the show is one thing. Going back and correcting or fixing programming mistakes that you've made is, is something entirely different. And if you're managing you know, that many channels over that many queues, how do, you, how do you go about correcting and fixing mistakes you make? Because, you know, as we've said, during the, during the tech rehearsal process, you don't have time to stop the, you know, stop the action and go back and, and you know, fix, fix, fix problems. Or well, it may be, be, be mistakes, but you know, artistic changes that have been made that directly affect the program. New pages. Done. They come and give you new script pages. Yeah. You know what so we have, a, um, we have a, a, a panel here called Channel Cues, and this really allows us to delve into the data that runs the queue list itself. Um, if you think of a channel, it's made up of a, a series of modules, you know, input, EQ, delay, dynamics, aux sends. They are all modules within a channel. Um, and then potentially for each queue in the show, these modules might have different settings. Um, so this, can, this channel cues panel allows us to uh, delve into the data. And actually, if I expand the, the Frodo channel here, each of the black, darker entries indicates a change of setting. I would thank the people over there for making all the noise. Um, the, the black, darker uh, elements here show me, without even firing any cues and without listening to the audio, I can look down this and know that you know, in Frodo Hat, there is a change here to the delay, there is a change to the EQ. There was an insert change. It's grayed out in the subsequent queues, so I can see that nothing changes. And then we get down to here, queue 10.8, and again, those things change again. So it gives me a great sort of visual uh, aid from a design and a, an operator's point of view to see where the changes are going to happen without actually firing any queues. So that's kind of like a way to investigate when you have a massive amount of inputs. You can find out where possible errors in your programming happen. And you can copy and paste, or you paste and assign, make assignment changes, and do quite a bit of programming from this page itself. Absolutely. You know, when you open up, um, when you open up, pick one of these cells and open the assign panel, it shows you all the potential options of settings for that channel. So, you know, if you've had a different EQ for Frodo Hat, you can take that EQ from Frodo Hat and use it elsewhere within within the queue list, either in the same channel or actually, in, indeed, even in, in a different channel. So it's like a, I don't know why you'd do that. But. No, but it's a, it's, a, it's a massive sort of three-dimensional database of all of the channels, all of the data in all the queues, and it allows us to, as I say, to go back and look at where we've made changes. Um, if this looks a little bit intimidating, um, we can just show the changes as stars. So as you, as you go up and down the queue list, the star represents a change, and it's, it's a much maybe cleaner, easier way as a designer when you don't have time on your hands to go back and, and see where the data is, 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 uh, is different, maybe. And if you look in the EQ here in Q52, these purple stars, we've used color coding again to indicate the type of change. So we said earlier that you can use the optional button, a button on the surface to instigate a change just for one Q, an exception to our normal auto update rule. The purple indicates that, you know, that is the case. So again, you know, we don't have to fire cues. We don't have to, you know, necessarily, you know, remember what data it is. We can come from here and, and see instantly what the change is and probably why it was made as well. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then correct it if, we, if, if there's no longer a use for that particular flagged uh, change, uh, if whatever the reason that we, we did an option EQ change that restricted that EQ to just one queue instead of tracking it and propagating it throughout the queue list, um, if that reason has been removed for some you know if 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 somebody did lean against a lamppost which with their head and and it put some horrible artifact um, 
uh, which we tried to correct with EQ and the director then said, no, don't lean against the lamppost. We can go, go back in and remove that flag and change it back. Let's talk about other cool features that really stand, pull Digico to the top of the, um, of the market. Can you talk a little bit about the nodal delays? So, I mean, you know, certainly all the changes, you know, all the, so the software features we've talked about at the moment are exactly that. They're software features. They don't rely on any change in DSP. Um, but uh, the one element of the console where there is a DSP change to the, to the normal console, the live sort of format console, as you say, is, um, is, in, is in the matrix. Yep. So, so, at a push of a button, you now have a delay matrix. So in this version of software, this is a SD7 QT. This is our biggest quantum engine theater software with a 48 by 48 matrix. Each of those individual nodes, 2,300 and something nodes, can have an individual delay time associated with it. So as you're you know, designing theater sound and, and making changes uh, to uh, what, speaker placements. And speaker placement, sound effects, um, band balance, moving up and down stage. Um, any of that kind of time-related mixing. Um, it's a very powerful tool. Fantastic. Well, as we're kind of getting close to the end here, one thing I see from Observer being with the company for about 11 years, but the, the theater development happened way before I started. But what I can see and hear and from other people that use the system, what's fantastic is it's been a community development. You know, there's been the key leaders of it with Andrew and his team, but the company actually listens to, to engineers who actually use the, the product. And that's what's really developed and made the, the, the T yeah, software I, so powerful. I, I can't take credit for all of this. We involved all the theatre sound designers we could lay our hands on, both, uh, both in the UK and the US. So a lot of these things are the product of um, you know, communal input. Mm -hmm. and, and that process continues. You know. One of the things we do is we continue to listen. So, you know, if sound designers out there have ideas, and you know, we we did a seminar in, in New York earlier in the week, and some great ideas, and you know, discussion over potential new features that we might be able to implement that makes your life of programming shows and running shows easier. If people have ideas, you know, we are all ears and and, and welcome the input because ultimately it's going to help us make our software better for you. So where do we go from here? Well. We've heard us talk and we've shown the software for the SD7 Quantum T. Not every show, not every theater has the budget for that. And the nice thing about Digico is that you can use the theater software in the SD7, the SD10, or the more affordable SD9. In addition, if you just don't even have that budget, even our, the live software gives you a lot of features. Not all of the features of the theater, but still that you could actually still cheat. The, the, the regular live software is very, very powerful. But also keep in mind, Maybe you want to program or see what the theater software is like. You can download the software for free. You can turn on the theater software. You don't have to own it for your, to run it on your laptop. And you can just download that from uh, the website digico.biz. That's spelled B-I-Z, in case you're from Minnesota. <laughs> All right. Any questions here? Well, we just want to thank you for... Oh, yeah, go ahead. Hang on. He's got a microphone. I um like anything related to Broadway is a I I come from a different background like it's just a live song engineer but mm -hmm. how do you trigger the cues like you use it like a time code or semte or you do it by like everything yeah, by intercom it's called next yeah okay it's just like just yeah. like that okay you can <laughs> also trigger it yeah, yeah but any number of other other because Broadway it's still a live performance mm -hmm. and at any time a actor may ad lib a line or decide to have some artistic license in their performance the engineer is following and knows every beat of the show and when to actually take that cue button is is very precise within the, the orchestration of the actual show okay so it's, yeah yeah i mean look from a technical yeah. point of view gpi triggers midi next mm -hmm. button yeah. firing it from you know some other control control system all possible but yeah. the reality is the next Q button on the work surface is the one that everyone presses. Yeah. Okay. That's amazing. I, I would say Congrats. more often than not, the desk, you're going to fire off a Q and the desk might be firing off something like to fire off your Q lab for an effect, but you're driving it manually.
Any other questions? Yeah, oh, there we go. So what provisions are there in the software for um, like that oh crap moment? Like I've had it before where I'm, I'm the bane which, of my existence. One? Right, exactly. <laughs> but like, um, let's say a, an actor is not going to be on stage at all for the rest of the show. I mean, I've, I've gotten to the point where I literally turn off the receiver because I'm, I'm on a Yamaha, so I don't have the luxury of going through all my cues in, in the middle of the show and updating them. How do you mute? Do you press? Yeah, we have, a, we have a hard mute function um, as part oh, wow. of the channel, which um, uh, overrides all snapshot programming. Um, awesome. You know, all cue programming. Sorry, Andrew. Before he throws this water over me. Uh, all cue programming, everything. It is literally a kill the channel. Actually, that allows someone maybe to go and fix the bad right. receiver pack or, or if it's know, just a bad mic connection. whatever it is. Right. And at that point, we can take the hard mute off. And as we fire you know, subsequent cues, all the programming comes back into effect. So That's yeah. outstanding. Or the alternate input. Or, yeah. If they have a backup mic, we have right. an alternate input on channel, which is basically an AB switch for another input. So you can have that all on one channel, channel strip? Yeah, then? so you just flip over. So even to a point of just having, say, a wired mic on stage uh, hardwired to all of your wireless packs. So if you do lose a pack, they can grab the hardwired mic. You drop in the alternate input. Now all their programming is there for that your spare mic. Awesome. Fantastic. Is that it? Any other questions? Do Beautiful I have, day. Oh yeah, go ahead. Up in front. In front of the screen. Yeah. Thanks. So QLab, the way a sound designer brings that session to you. The outputs they're using are usually what? Dante? Or Maddie or Dante. Um, and then how yeah. many outputs have you? I mean, typically I'd say it's, they keep it, I'd say typically around 16, but I've seen bigger, like closer to 30. SpongeBob had a whole bunch with all the special effects. And, yeah, and then you feed that through matrices and then? Yep. And then you, okay. yep. Okay. Yeah, usually it's land on an input and then that goes to a group, to a matrix. So it technically, it's, those tracks are coming from a computer, so you could run it through an MGB, which technically give you 128 channels. Could be a UB Matty box, could be Dante. So just basically, kind of think of it as just another stage rack of sources that you're coming into your desk. Fantastic. Anyone else? Um, I, I'll just chime in and say that I was uh, very fortunate to use an SD5 uh, mixing monitors for the Eagles. And the great thing about the Digico products is they are mature by many, many years. And there's a lot of very sophisticated features in the software that you don't appreciate until you dive in and start using them. And then you find out how addictive they are. <laughs> Had to take your picture. The, uh, the SD5 uh, helped me do a better job than I could have done on any other console when I was out with the Eagles. So I, my thanks yeah. to all of yeah. the software guys at Digico. <laughs> as well as the hardware guys. Thank, thank you, guys. You. Thank you, everybody, for being on the panel, and thank you, everybody, for stopping and spending the rest of your afternoon with us.